So again, welcome everyone. This is the official kickoff of our DDH 2024 Nothing Without Us spectacular series of awesome events that we'll be hosting uh, to get the disability community together and advocate for good public policy uh, in our state. Um, so I'm gonna run through a little bit of our um, housekeeping stuff. I'm gonna talk about some trends and I bet this is on an agenda slide. We'll start with housekeeping items. Uh, just so everybody knows, I'm a white male uh, with dark graying hair. I've got a little bit of a beard going on. I've got on an eggplant purple suit with a little uh, flag pin on my lapel. Uh, and I've got a blue shirt, blue shirt with a blue tie. So if you uh, need American Sign Language interpretation, you can pin the video of the interpreter to the top of your screen so that they are permanently visible right there at the top. So if you go up to your meeting window where you can see the participants, uh, choose our interpreter, and there's these three little buttons right there up in the top right corner. Click on those, and the middle one should be pin. See, I'm trying to move around my uh, pictures to join you. Uh, if you would like closed captioning, that's at the bottom of your screen. So you can turn on your captions by clicking on the CC button at the bottom. There's a little up carrot, up arrow. If you click on that, it'll say show subtitles uh, you, um, and you can see the full transcript and you can uh, fool around with the subtitle settings so that they suit your needs. If you have any questions about any of those housekeeping items, please feel free to put them in the chat. If you have any questions at all about anything I'm talking about, also please feel free to put in the Q&A section. Uh, and we'll try to monitor both so that I don't miss anything. Uh, if I do miss anything, um, I'll, I'll go back to it. So we have a full jam-packed agenda this afternoon, so I'm going to get right to it. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about some trends that I'm seeing so far in year two of the 113th General Assembly. We'll talk about our 2024 TDC legislative priorities with some fabulous guest speakers. Uh, you can see that we have uh, some advocates, self-advocates, experts, and representatives. So I think we have a pretty good uh, selection of folks to, um, to help carry us through to talk about our priorities. Then I'm gonna talk about the big picture of legislation that we're watching and where we kind of stand with those and how to get involved. Um, one uh, request for some leeway, it's possible that our guest speakers kind of show up when they're able, particularly our legislative guest speaker. Um, they have a lot on their plate as do all of our speakers. So it, it's possible that I will stop saying something in the middle of saying it, but I will make sure to get back to that. All right, trends. Uh, like it, like uh, the agenda mentioned, this is year two of the General Assembly. So every General Assembly session is two years. Um, it, it kind of corresponds with the House uh, re-election cycle. Um, so this is year two. However, oddly, we have a couple new faces replacing some uh, seats that needed to be filled. We've got Afton Ben out of Nashville. And we've got Timothy Hill out east. We've got the official returns of uh, Justin Jones and Justin Pearson after their expulsion last year. But pretty much besides those two or four, however you're interpreting that, it's the same cast of characters. Um, as is typical in a second year session, we move fast. Um, so we got kind of a preview of some of our legislative priorities. I'm going to get to those next uh, during both the state of the state, but also in the lead up uh, to the session because our legislators are going to float that stuff see what's up, see what people think about it so they can hit the ground running. Now, if you'll all recall just a couple weeks ago, we had a big old snowpocalypse, a snowmageddon that shut down the entire state for a week. And that week just happened to be the second week of this year's session. And so everybody is behind and acting frenetically as such. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of running around. So it's not just legislative speed for the things that we're watching. It is quite truly the literal speed of people moving around Cordell Hall. Now, don't let that intimidate you because I'm hoping that because you're on this legislative webinar, you'll also join us for DDH, we can move just as fast. So I wouldn't worry about that. But once we see things start to get dropped, especially these big priority bills, they are gonna move fast. We're not gonna see a whole lot of rolling of bills where they'll be put on the calendar and then the sponsor will get up and say, no, we're gonna wait on that. Um, when people are ready to go, they're ready to go. They don't want a lot of amendments this year. So they're talking about the idea here is a clean bill, um, which means that 
it does exactly what they want and they've worked with all the folks who are going to see it through committees uh, and that there will be no amendments or amendments won't be accepted. So speed, speed, speed. We're moving fast this year. Um, the big topic du jour, the topic of conversation that comes from the governor, his big legislative priority and his big initiative is a big legacy project in his mind. It is the statewide expansion of private school vouchers. So we in Tennessee have a couple different versions of this voucher. In the disability community, we have the individualized education counts or IEAs, um, and those serve specifically students with disabilities. We have a small education savings account uh, program, which is what we would typically think of with a private school voucher. It is only available in Davidson, Shelby, and Hamilton County right now, and you have to meet income thresholds to qualify. Uh, what the governor is proposing is every county across the state, and after two years, no income restriction, up to 20,000 folks. Um, and I say that that's what he's proposed because it is currently in caption form. He has not filed this bill yet. They accidentally filed this bill uh, about two weeks ago and immediately withdrew it and took it off the, the website, but we got a little bit of a glimpse. It's hard to say whether or not that's the final product or that truly was premature a draft. Um, so I'm getting a little ahead of myself talking about private school vouchers, but uh, a lot of people are very interested in seeing what happens with that. Uh, another big theme that we're seeing cut across a lot of pieces of legislation are attempts to address the need in the state for more mental health services uh, for folks with that need, as well as services for folks with intellectual disabilities. And while that might kind of sound like a good thing, um, there are some drawbacks. Uh, to the types of things that they're proposing. Uh, I'll get into some of those later, um, but a lot of these are in response to um, the Covenant shooting last year and um, attempts to address public safety by means of mental health uh, supports and services. Um, so for the last four years, for as long as I've worked in this position, the state of Tennessee has been raking in the big bucks. We've had multi-billion dollar budget surpluses every year, um, except this year. This year, we are actually running a budget deficit. Last I checked, it was over $400 million short in tax revenue. So this is money that we had set aside last year. We said, we're going we're gonna to spend it in 2024. We're about $400 million short of what we need to be able to spend. Not to worry, we have an enormous rainy day account uh, in the state, over $2 billion of money that's sitting there just for the sake of a rainy day. And I don't know about any of you, but if you haven't seen a rainy day in the last four years, I don't know if one exists. Um, but this year, I say no money, no problems, because that is the uh, kind of mantra down at the Cordell Hall Legislative Office building. Just there is no money. Um, and so there will be that will limit the scope of the types of legislation that will pass this year, um, private school vouchers notwithstanding. Um, but we've had the opportunity to use these funds to do things that are good for the disability community, sure, uh, but also do things like uh, lure forward here to build the Blue Oval City out west, um, to give money to the Titans to build a new stadium for extended grocery tax breaks and business tax breaks. So that's how we've been using this money, uh, but we have hit a hard wall here. There is no money, which means we have no problems. Uh, and then so if you'll recall last year, there was a bit of drama uh, with some expulsions, um, some well, lots of social media sniping at each other, and some outright physical confrontations uh, on the House floor. We thought that maybe over the summer, everybody would go to summer camp together and kumbaya and put all their differences aside, do trust falls, all sorts of things to kind of get our legislator legislature back on track and more like um, the General Assembly than a middle school. Well, they didn't go to summer camp. Uh, so we've already seen some drama this year um, when it comes to uh, the partisan divide, right? So the Republicans have a super majority, which means they have two thirds of the votes in the House and the Senate, uh, which is a pretty impenetrable block. Um, and Democrats and, and others don't like that. Um, and so they've gone back and forth and spent a lot of time doing things from both sides that are not exactly governing and are more like bickering and sniping. Um, one of the big early controversies this year was some changes to the rules about who can watch the House floor. 
So if you've ever been to the legislature to the Capitol and gone into the House chamber, up above on the second floor, there's kind of uh, a balcony of seats up there. Typically, or in past years, you've been able to walk up there and just pick a seat if there's space. If there's no space, the state trooper at the bottom says, hey, no space, sorry. Uh, this year, it's been cordoned off into three areas. You've got the general public area, uh, which is straight to the back, uh, and that operates as normal. If there's space, you can go up there. And then there's the special VIP space where each uh, House member gets one ticket per session that they can give out to a constituent to go sit there. They call it the golden ticket down there, and that allows you to sit over there on the left side, and then it's media and lobbyists to the right side. So part of this is in response to uh, the concerns about disruptions from the audience, uh, especially in light of the really emotional responses we saw after the Covenant shooting. Uh, parts of these are to tamp down on dissent and protest. Um, but there are other parts, and this is what Cameron Sexton, the Speaker of the House, would tell you, is that this is just meant to keep order. These are the rules of the House. We set them every year. Everybody votes on them. If you don't like it, then you find better rules and you can vote on those, that they more, more closely, um, more closely uh, resemble those uh, in the U.S. Congress, which is uh, an interesting take. But uh, I see Joy says in here, I went today and left. No way for wheelchair to balconies to watch Senator House chambers. I was offered to watch the screen in the lobby. Yes, the Capitol is very inaccessible. Um, they have some elevators, um, but once you get off the elevator, especially on the Senate side, it is a narrow little walkway to try to get up to the balcony uh, that I don't think many wheelchairs could fit through. So yes, Joy, I, I hear you and I've seen it. Those are our trends. So I don't think we have Representative Hale yet. So we'll come back to Representative Hale uh, and we'll move forward and start talking about some of our uh, TDC disability community uh, priority pieces of legislation this year. So it looks like uh, Bliss Welch is going to come up next. Uh, she is a single working mom to a tween, Annabelle. Uh, we visited her out in uh, Chattanooga uh, this last weekend. They are into Legos and they are really good at Legos. And Bliss, if she is so willing, might tell you it has a favorite color. She is the founder of Inclusion is Bliss, and she can tell you about that, and a member of the Tennessee Council on Developmental Disabilities, and she has been working very hard with us uh, on a specific piece of legislation that I hope she can tell you about and why it's important to her. So Bliss, uh, if you don't mind, would you talk a little bit about our Pathways to 10 Care bill, about who you are and how others can get involved? And if you wouldn't mind, would you provide an audio description? Just tell us briefly what you look like so that everyone on the call can get a picture. Thank you. Sure. I am seated in a power wheelchair. I don't know really how much of it you can see. Um, I have a black dress with a pink cardigan, uh, blonde hair, and glasses. Thanks, Bliss. Can you tell us a little bit about the Pathways to 10 Care Bill and how you came to be an advocate for it? Sure. So the way that I understand the uh, Pathway to 10 Care is it's a Medicaid buy-in program. Um, Medicaid offers a lot of long-term supports and services that private insurance companies do not offer. And you would be able to pay in um, like normal insurance premiums to be able to have access to those additional supports and services. Uh, as a teenager, I was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. And so I knew that um, with a progressive muscle wasting disease that there would be a process and things would get worse. And eventually I would have to rely on a personal caregiver. And so I went to school, uh, obtained a bachelor's and a master's degree because I wanted to be as independent as possible for as long as possible. Um, unfortunately, in 2020, the disease progression reached a point to where I did need assistance from a personal care attendant. Uh, that's something that I have been paying out of pocket for because I do not qualify for the Medicaid uh, program in Tennessee. And so this has been something that I know Tennessee needs. We're one of only four states that does not have a buy-in option to Medicare, Medicaid, I'm sorry, Medicaid. 
Thank you. Struggling to come off mute here. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So uh, exactly as Bliss just told us, Pathways to End Care is essentially a Medicaid buy-in program. We call it something else because Medicaid buy-in sounds vaguely close to Medicaid expansion. That is not a particularly popular um, policy option at the General Assembly. And you could, uh, in order to be uh, eligible for this program, uh, you would have to have a qualifying disability. So you'd have to qualify for Medicaid, except for the income and asset restrictions, um, which are, as many of you know, uh, uh, low, right? So it's $2,000 in assets. And if you're a single individual adult, about $10.10 .10 an hour if you work 40 hours a week for 52 weeks a year. Um, so pretty low. And so what you do is you could pay a premium up to 5% of your income uh, to access those important services. And so Bliss, I, I know you talked a little bit about it last time I saw you um, with Fox 9, but could you talk about how this program uh, would impact your life or change your uh, the, the options that are available to you? Sure, absolutely. Um, as everybody knows, it's very time consuming to have a disability. And when you add in um, a caregiver, you become somebody's boss. And so that takes extra time as well. Uh, and then, of course, the financial aspect of having a, dis a disability is huge. Um, I'm fortunate that I have great friends and family who step up and help with my physical needs, as well as some of the financial needs that I have. Um, in addition to personal care, though, there's also equipment that the program would cover, such as um, like a Hoyer lift or a device for um, bathing or transferring to a toilet that your private insurance company doesn't cover either. And so I think that one of the main things that I'm really excited about if this bill passes is how much it's going to help my mental health. Because for the past three years, there's been quite a struggle of finding a new normal and having, you know, someone in my home helping with things that nobody really wants to have help with. Um, so I feel like that would vastly improve as well to just to be able to support myself again, because as an adult, you want to be independent. And as much as I appreciate the assistance from my family and friends, I still would like to be financially secure and able to support myself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and that makes a, a ton of sense. And I'm sure a lot of folks here can, um, you know, recognize that sentiment in their self. So last question, uh, if folks on this call wanted to get involved in uh, helping our Pathways to 10 Care bill pass, what would be your advice to them? Well, to reach out to their representatives, whether that be by phone call, email, or scheduling an appointment to, you know, meet with them in Nashville, Disability Day on the Hill is coming up at the end of the month. Um, there's also a website that has been created, Music City Wheels, where there's a lot of great information to, you know, kind of walk you through what this looks like and why there's a need for it with comparison to other states as well. And there's a very brief survey at the end of, um, towards the bottom of the website that takes less than two minutes to fill out. Um, so that would be very beneficial as well. And not only individuals with disabilities, but parents, siblings, friends, you know, anybody can reach out and um, to their representatives to let the, them know why this program is so needed. Um, and those people are also welcome to fill out the form on the website as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Bliss. All right, next up we have Jackie Cancer. Um, Jackie is a brilliant policy mind who is gonna speak, oh, a, yeah. is gonna speak a little bit on um, our effort to push for paid family care in the state. Yeah. She's based in West Tennessee and is the mother to a young adult with complex disabilities. Uh, she has worked in the past on improving crisis systems, ER stabilization protocols, and protecting students with severe challenging behavior symptoms, all very important things and things that I would love to work with Jackie on. Uh, and her Jackie and her daughter reside on their peaceful rural homestead, Bunny Egg Acres, and they enjoy photography, baking, and creative projects. 
So Jackie, to start off, could you tell us a little bit yeah. about the state of uh, family caregiving in Tennessee and, and what we're doing to work on that? Yeah, hi, thanks for having me, Jeff. And, um, and just to give a visual, I am uh, a white woman with dark black hair, pulled back. I'm wearing a black top with a pastel cardigan and um, I have left-sided facial paralysis. I am a self-advocate, parent advocate, and as Jeff said, a policy advocate. And yes, so family caregiving is a huge passion of mine because my daughter has really high acuity medical complex needs. And this is an area that not just Tennessee, but most states across the nation really struggles with finding a way to service this population in a home and community-based setting at the levels that they need. So this is a nationwide movement. Uh, We have been addressing Mm -hmm. this at the CMS level as well as individually within each state. But we are in a transition period still from deinstitutionalization where we shut down state hospitals and now people do get to stay in their homes and family homes more often, but that means that natural supports in this generation are experiencing a level of care burden that prior generations did not have. And we need better systems set up to support them so that people with disabilities can remain in their homes and communities because the natural support system is their greatest asset. I serve as my daughter's translator in many ways. She has very associative speech. So though she has some language, if she wants chicken nuggets, she would say bees Mm -hmm. because she wants chicken nuggets with honey from McDonald's and honey comes from bees. So she would say bees. And that's not something that necessarily an AAC device or some other form of technology is going to be able to replace a caregiver for. We do high level ADL support. Um, I have to do cathing. I had to learn how to do that, which is a skilled nursing staff. I manage complex medications, um, scheduled medications, 11 a day. Uh, I twice a week, I go to Nashville at least twice a week to from Henry County to take her to appointments. There's a lot that is involved. We serve as CNAs, skilled nurses, um, they're social workers, they're translators, they're advocates, and we do all of this unpaid. They, at most currently, you can get a thousand dollar a month stipend, but the problem is, though my daughter has been on ECF since 2018, ECF really Mm -hmm. does not provide the level, the high level of medical care she needs. Mm -hmm. And so she's unable to access the paid supports through ECF, but she requires 24 seven care. So when am I supposed to work? When, how am I supposed to have a Monday through Friday, nine to five job? That's not possible. And many, many caregivers are in this same position. Now I'm fortunate due to my policy work that I'm able to have a contracted position where I work for a a nonprofit agency and can do project work on time pockets that I have available when she's sleeping or here and there. But most caregivers do not have access to that. And we really are looking for a way to be more self-sustainable. we still have bills to pay. We have to keep food on the table for our kids. And we don't want to be reliant on food stamps or government assistance or anything else. We just want to be fairly compensated for the high skill work that we are providing. Many of our children, for example, my daughter right now, she's approved for 56 hours a week of CNA care. The most they have ever been able to staff her was 40. Well, those extra 16 hours a week are approved, but just sitting there unstaffed, I'm providing that care, it's approved, so why am I not able to onboard as her care, and I'd be paid that wage with the agency. And then this would allow families to not have a work gap history, because the ultimate goal is eventually my daughter and others that are in similar situations 
they will be able to become more independent. They won't need such a high level of support. But then what happens to the caregiver who has been out of the workforce for 15 years, 20 years, and then tries to go back in and they don't have any work history. We're also not collecting social security credits. So what happens when we need to retire? There's a lot of issues here, but if we're able to onboard with an agency for the care that they're approved for anyways, the care that we're already be providing them anyways, then we would be able to have sustainable wages. We would be able to pay into the system and have things like earned income credit. We would be able to buy into group health insurance. We're not asking for Medicaid from the state or anything like that. We're just asking for a way to have a dignified life and be fairly compensated for the meaningful work that thousands of caregivers across the nation perform every single day. Exactly, and thank you, Jackie. And uh, if anybody has questions about that, Jackie is an immense source of information and knowledge on this issue, not just from her experience, but from her professional work as well. Um, so Jackie, what um, could, could you run us through just very briefly um, like a couple of policy options. What could this look like or what do you know that other states do that you think would be good in Tennessee? Well, mm -hmm. caregiving, they're using a company called Team Select and they have done multiple webinars on this. Um, they are happy to just consult with states that are interested in this. But the way that they are doing it is a state would look at where are their greatest unmet needs. New York is the most recent example. They have put in complex care assistance. So they are really focusing on the high acuity levels. And Team Select comes in and performs and sets up these training modules and these training programs. Parents go through a rigorous training process that's anywhere from 75 to 250 hours. Just depends on what the service is. They go through the training process and then they onboard with an agency and they are paid a competitive wage. They're able to shop around agencies. So it's just, it's exactly like any other employment. And like I said, then they are able to buy into group health insurance and all these other things. And so that's a really great option there. Um, other states use family CNA programs through Team Select. Um, that's an option. I really do prefer the option of wages. Now I've polled the community, there is some discussion and some would prefer stipends. Uh, there's some concerns with loss of benef other benefits that they may have coming into the home. So that's something to consider. Uh, ideally, of course, we would have a choice. Um, we would maintain things like group four with the stipend and families could, choose that option, and then they could have a, um, a wages option. But, you know, we're not really asking for any difference in the budget because these are already services that these children are approved for. We're just asking for them to be fulfilled. This really benefits the state because we could actually raise our utilization rates, which is something that CMS does monitor. And it's actually gonna become even more of an issue because of federal legislation that's requiring more transparency in utilization and demographic data. And that's really going to highlight the, the, the severity of unmet needs with this population once that, that demographic data starts coming out with unmet needs. So this is a way for Tennessee to get ahead of that, respond to it, and just, be able to pay the families that are providing it. Great, yes, thank you, Jackie, and thank you for sharing all of that. Um, so the effort that we're working on this year is a resolution, um, it's sitting in the Senate right now, the move forward in the House, um, but this is part of a multi-year effort um, because this has been a really stubborn object for 10 care. This is something they do not wanna do, uh, so we're hoping that this year, if we can pass this resolution, we can signal to the General Assembly and to the state and to TenCare that this is something that we want uh, and this is something that we need. Uh, and that if they're not going to do it at the urging of the General Assembly, 
um, next year and, the, and hopefully, well, hopefully just next year, uh, we can do more than urge. We can dictate and direct that they do so via legislative action. So thank you, Jackie. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll make sure to relay them to you. Uh, I appreciate you joining us. Thank you. So next up, we got Amy and Tom. Amy is the executive director of ABLE Youth, a youth adaptive sports nonprofit in Nashville. She's a member of the Nashville Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities and sits on several disability-related boards in Nashville. Tom Jedlowski is our intrepid director of communications technology here at the Tennessee Disability Coalition. Uh, he is currently the chair of the Nashville Mayor's Committee for People with Disabilities. Oops, I, I missed, sorry. Um, so uh, if you all wouldn't mind coming off mute and talking a little bit about uh, some of the things that you're working on. Absolutely. Yeah, would you like me to start, Tom, or do you want to start? Oh, I'll jump in, Amy, and then you can chime in with me, too. Um, you know, I asked Amy to to join us because, you know, you're it can easily become kind of a, oh, wow, this seems kind of complicated, or these people have a special skill set, or they're on all these boards, or, or you know, or what have you. And it's funny how, you know, Amy ended up being on this call because she really just reached out because, you know, we've connected through the mayor's advisory committee, but she just kind of emailed me one day and said, hey, I want to go, you know, renew my parking placard and there's some really ableist language uh, in this renewal application. And I said, you know what, that's not okay. Let me take it to my team and I'll let, you know, Amy take it from there. But at any rate, um, you don't necessarily just have a special skill set to say, hey, that's, that's not okay. And we need to do something better about it. Yeah, um, so I, uh, like Tom said, I went to go renew my license plate and parking um, uh, parking placard. And um, I've been a driver, you know, since I was 16 and I've had a wheelchair, I've been a wheelchair user um, all, of, all of my life. And um, I've lived in Tennessee since 2004, which is crazy that it's about to be 20 years. But I, and I have never noticed this on this form. So I don't know if it's you've been there all along and I just didn't notice it and kept on going and kept on going about my day or or whatever. But um, I got the form and it said, it mentioned confined to a wheelchair um, using that outdated language. Um, I think it was five at least different times on one page. And you know, it doesn't, it definitely is outdated ableist language, but it also didn't seem to match language that I saw being used elsewhere in the state either. I thought that was also interesting. And so like Tom had said, you know, I am on some boards and I'm, you know, I've been in the disability world for a long time, but definitely this form of advocacy is not something that I've done before really, you know, at this level and, um, and not something that I do very often. Certainly I advocate for myself, but on the legislative type of things. It's not something I have a lot of experience with, but, you know, I just thought it wasn't right. It definitely is not how I experience being a wheelchair user. For me, being a wheelchair user is freedom. If I didn't have a wheelchair, then I wouldn't be able to do anything. And so I thought it was actually even really more interesting that it was on the form for being a driver or a passenger, depending on um, your circumstance, because not only does my wheelchair to me mean freedom to go do what I want, but it's also using confined to a wheelchair as a confining thing, meaning to be able to go into a car that brings you even more freedom than your wheelchair even ever could. So it's just really, really strange that that appeared on that specific form. And so I just thought about it and I knew that I knew Tom and I didn't, I didn't have really have any idea what to do or where to take it or what, you know, anything like that, but I knew that the coalition and Tom were really involved in that kind of thing. And I just sent him an email and said, hey, do you, have you ever seen this or noticed this or know anything about it? Like this is really outdated and ableist language. And is there anything that can be done about it to get it to change? And I also mentioned, you know, it's definitely language that I'm not seeing elsewhere. So, you know, why are we seeing it here? And so um, I emailed Tom and uh, through the wonderful people at the coalition, it's, um, and you know, people that they then reached out to that uh, it's gone further than really I could take it. I'm glad that I noticed it and I spoke up and said something, but then, uh, you know, I didn't have to do a ton more difficult things. Other than that, I was able to just, you know, 
speak up for something that I saw that wasn't right and then ask somebody else and, uh, you know, and kind of let the chain go from there. So um, it looks good. That hopefully we're going to be able to get that changed. And so, yeah, I'm really glad that I that I did it. And I think it was easy, especially I think everybody on here, you know, knows who the coalition is. And that I think don't hesitate to send in your questions or your things that you see not right to them if you don't know anywhere else to bring it to. Amy, just real quick, what advice would you give to other people who might be on the call and say, you know, I've seen some things that I I am not comfortable with or that I think could be better? Um, what advice would you give them? Yeah, you know, I think that don't assume that other people are are doing something about it, that you have the opportunity to do something about it because other people either also may have thought it was too hard and decided not to do anything or did not know what to do or just went about their day and and, and uh, you know, kept on going and things don't get changed and society doesn't move forward when we when we do that. And so I think this the biggest thing is to say something. If you don't know anybody to, to bring it to that you don't know what to do, then now you know the coalition can either help you move that forward or go to the right person. But I think um, the biggest thing is just to notice and to, you know, if you see something out and out and about, take a picture of it whatever it might be, and then, you know, bring it forward to somebody and to kind of see what happens. How hard was it? No, it's not hard at all. No, yeah. we, I know you well. And so it was really, it was great to be able to send you an email in the middle of the week and say, hey, you know, I, I noticed this. So it's not not hard at all. And I think that's the thing is like, we think it's too complex or I don't maybe really know somebody who can definitely do something about this. But I think with a coalition or, you know, if it's something else, maybe there's somebody else who you knew that can can start the conversation. but. You don't have to be the one to do all of the work or have to know exactly the right people. As long as you bring it forward at least one step, then I think there are plenty of other people who do know the right step next steps to move it, you know, really forward. Exactly. Wonderful. Thanks, Tom and Amy. Um, yeah. So an update on this one: our our bill that we put in on on behalf of Amy. Uh, it, it's a very simple bill. It just says we should change this to more appropriate modern language. And so that's what the bill does. It passed uh, through the first two committees on the House side and the first on the Senate side. It's set for the Senate floor, I think, tomorrow, today, <laughs> um, or else it'll be uh, the beginning of next week. Uh, the House hasn't calendared it on its floor yet, um, but this one is well on its way, uh, and I'm not really seeing any uh, obstacles to its passage. That said, you know, I always knock on wood and I always make sure that your best advocate foot is, is forward. So I'll keep everybody up to date on that. So thanks. And, you know, and I will say one more thing is that I think that there's so many things people in general in society don't know about people with disabilities. So I don't, I think that if, if I hadn't spoken up, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that there are people who thought that was completely fine. And so I think also just realize that you, as a person with a disability or as an ally towards people with disabilities, know things that other people just don't know. And so I think your lived experience can really, um, really help society and bring about a lot of change. Absolutely. Just to being who you are. Yeah. And I 100% and I agree with that. And I, I personally think that the disability community has a special place in that. The idea of universal uh, policy making, where what benefits the disability community is always going to benefit everybody else. So when we do something for ourselves, we're really doing something for our, our whole state. So it looks like um, we haven't seen Representative Hale yet. Uh, so I'm going to move on and talk a little bit about um, legislation that we're watching this year. So we talked about a bunch of these. So I'm, I'm not going to belabor any of these points. Probably I tend to be long-winded. So if I belabor, I apologize. Um, so the first one, or the left side you're looking at, is stuff that we're working very directly on and have um, uh, that we have um, a, a stake and, and have, have been working. Sorry, got distracted. Uh, so left side are affirmative TDC disability community things. So Pathway to 10 Care, that's our Medicaid buy-in program. Uh, what we're working on there is simply getting it on the calendar. It's been filed. It looks good. Um, and, and I think we are ready to get going with that pretty soon. Uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about is... Um, an, an opportunity to overcome what was likely going to be the biggest barrier to its passage, and that's that it's going to cost money. 
Uh, but we in our states have a very, very special Medicaid waiver with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, CMS, uh, that allows us for, to keep something called shared savings. So money that isn't spent on our Medicaid population or programs goes into a slush fund that we split with the feds. And Tennessee gets to keep part of those funds if we spend them on new programs and new populations. And lo and behold, we don't have a Medicaid buy-in program and we don't serve that population. So look, two for two right here. So we qualify to use these funds and at the behest of the speaker, Cameron Sexton, suggested that we write into our language that this is where the funding will come from. So I think with this one, we have a fantastic you know, ethical case. Um, this is an employment bill. We're an employment first state and very proud of it. Uh, and we are you know, sympathetic to the business community here and we wanna provide um, the, the greatest um, workforce that we possibly can. I think this contributes to that end. And we're, we're, this is a family's bill. This permits people to live lives without having to be concerned about the loss of their benefits. And so that just provides a level of freedom, uh, both financially, but also you know, socially, and just that freedom, the, the, the peace of mind, that it, it won't all go away in a second to the extent that we can all believe that. Um, but the obstacle is always gonna be money. If we can indeed tap into these funds and we'll make it on to the, um, the, the final budget passed by the General Assembly, I feel very good about this one. Right to Repair Part 2, that's um, uh, Representative Hale's bill that he's been working on. Uh, so what that one does is it is our much anticipated follow-up to Right to Repair Part 1. Right to Repair Part 1 did away with prior authorizations uh, for the repair of wheelchairs. Um, it was kind of a silly barrier that really slowed things down. Uh, say you had a flat tire, you'd have to make an appointment with your doctor, go to your doctor's office on your flat tire. Your doctor is going to have to look at you and say, yep, you still need that wheelchair. And only then can they start to order parts and begin to repair a wheelchair. So we did away with that last year. This year is the right to repair part of it. This bill creates three avenues to get your wheelchair fixed. One is the current avenue that exists already. That's just call up your manufacturer and they'll send out an authorized technician to fix it. When you have a Mazda, you go to the Mazda dealership, that kind of thing. The next is independent repair. So that's that right to repair. There's a big old list of things in the bill that an independent repair person could do. For example, that flat tire and go down to your corner bike shop and say, hey, can you order this? And they can put it on for you. Doesn't nullify your warranty and your insurance has to pay for it. That's a biggie. And then uh, the third is through twice yearly preventative maintenance. This is something that doesn't exist here or in any state. We are the first state to try to do something like this. And that's the opportunity for someone to come out from your, the person who sells you the wheelchair, your supplier, and check and see how things are going, going with your wheelchair and maybe get any issues before they become in need of repair, a broken something. Um, and so we think that these are, oh, and your insurance pays for it. Again, important. We think these are three really good ways to getting uh, your wheelchair repaired and getting your life back so you can keep on, keep on moving, keep on going to work, keep on getting into your community, that type of thing. Um, this one might have a little bit of a fiscal note, we're still working with legal on getting the language just right. Like I said, parts of these nobody's ever done before. So we wanna make sure that this bill does what it's supposed to do and doesn't do anything that it's not. Uh, so we're working with the legal department of the General Assembly to get that right. Disability parking placards, we, we just talked with Amy on this one, a uh, very important one. I think this one is gonna be our first bill to cross the finish line this year. Knock on wood, cross your fingers, all that stuff. Paid family caregiving resolution. This is what Jackie talked to us about. Again, this is a resolution. Quick reminder on resolutions, non-binding. These are really more of a sentiment than anything else. It says the General Assembly believes this. And if they pass this one, the General Assembly believes that the state should create a comprehensive statewide paid family caregiving program. Uh, and so passage of this one gives us an opportunity to go and talk to all our legislators about this issue, talk to them with an open mind. You know, we don't have a binding law or a binding bill on the table, we just wanna gain your support. And once we've established this support, we either get 10 care to do the right thing or we get the General Assembly to tell them to do the right thing in the coming years. Uh, plus one, uh, somebody else has one of these. Uh, Representative Antonio Parkinson and Senator Briggs uh, have a bill that says that you cannot be uh, excluded from being a DSP, working for an agency, and serving someone who lives in your house just because you live in that house. This one passed uh, insurance sub Tuesday, this Tuesday, uh, and it's going to go to insurance full on the House side. It's unclear how far this can go on the Senate side, but 
it's another opportunity for us to talk about this very important issue. Katie Beckett Part A stuff. We've been working with uh, families who have been enrolled in the Katie Beckett Part A program for a while, trying to make sure that after three years of implementation, this, this program, Katie Beckett, is working like it's supposed to. And in some respects, we heard that it was not. Uh, and part of that was the ability to use um, your extra funds, your non-Medicaid funds for the things that you actually need without having to spend your own money to do it. And so this is a really late comer to us. Uh, while we've been working with families and hearing families, uh, we didn't really have a legislative champion until one came to us with it. So this one is still in the very infant stages of this. I'm not making any promises on this one, but we're going to give it a try this year. Uh, and so we're still working out the details of what that looks like. We've got to, again, go to our good friends at Legal. I'm sure they're running down to the nubs of their pencil trying to work for us. Um, but we're really excited about this one. And, and we think it has a good possibility of making Katie Beckett better and, and work more efficiently for families who are enrolled. Here's a big one that I know the disability and the aging communities have been working on for decades. Uh, and that is a comprehensive Department of Disability and Aging. Uh, and this one is sponsored by our good friend, Senator Becky Massey. She's really leading the push on this. It's hard for me to describe the benefits of this without using weird corporate speak, um, but so I'm just gonna do it anyway. This really is an opportunity to streamline services and eliminate redundancies and make sure that we're using all of the funds that we get for our specific purposes. You know, the disability funds for di folks with disability, aging funds for folks with aging, and then the crossover between the two, that we're able to use those most efficiently to have the biggest impact. And that sounds like I'm saying a whole bunch of nothing, but if you take a look at the differences between DIDD and TCAD and the Department of Health, uh, the Department of uh, Housing and Urban Development around here, uh, we can see that they're all acting in silos. Uh, and that's especially impactful for the disability community uh, when they don't work together. So we're hoping that this department, should it pass, um, helps to improve uh, the types of services, the access to services that people with disabilities and those who are aging can access. Just, I'm sorry, I'm just checking the uh, chat while I got to the bottom of one list. Um, Jax uh, is uh, Representative Hale's uh, legislative assistant, his right hand, and like I will tell anybody who listen, uh, half of the best office that exists um, in Cordell Hall. They are very good friends to us. They carry many of our bills and they really understand the disability community. It looks like uh, Representative Hale is not able to make it. Um, Representative Hale had a funeral come up last minute and said he's a funeral director, uh, just FYI, uh, but he said he should be able to make it on. If not, uh, Jax would be happy to talk about uh, what we're working on if needed. He asked me to apologize for the scheduling error as well. Uh, Jax is available. Jax, could you run us through really quick uh, what our right to repair bill, the wheelchair bill does? Yeah, so um, I was actually kind of looking over it um, as you were walking through it, just to make sure I'm fully uh, fully familiar with it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and, and please uh, hop on it if I, if I hit this incorrectly, but what what now we're aiming to do is saying that we've removed the prior authorization. So now uh, people who are using wheelchairs are able to take those parts um, and, and they list a couple different parts that are like batteries, chargers, uh, leg loaners, non-positioning accessories, things like that. Um, and they're able, able to either self-repair it or take it to um actually i think that's him i think i think representative hill just um i think that's him too yeah it, they're e able to take it to uh, a third party so you know you don't necessarily have to take it to per mobile if you um if you have someone else who's willing to to help you repair that um and yeah he is he is here yeah. so yeah, thanks, uh, Jess. Um, Representative yes. Hill, can you hear us? I sure can, yes. Hey, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we were talking about your right to repair bill uh, and what we've been working on. So I've kind of explained how it works. Could you just give us a brief little uh, quip 
of how our advocates who are on the call can be involved in getting this passed? You know, the main thing is, is just, uh, I think, uh, as we go through the committee process, just letting the, the committee members know that this is a is definitely a help and, and a, a plus for our, our disabled community that, uh, you know, many times there's, there's restrictions or there's uh, unavailability of, of the companies being able to get. And if we're able to use a, an outside source to be able to do these repairs, then it just gets these repairs done quickly because uh, as, as some may be aware and some may not be, myself being in a wheelchair, I know how how uh, critical it is uh, because that's our lifeline and, and our mobility. So we need those repairs done on a more timely basis. So, so if they'll reach out to uh, committee members as we go through the subcommittee and the full committee and, and, uh, and let those members know that, that they support this and asking for their support as we uh, go through this, it, that's, that's a huge help. Wonderful, thank you. And just one more question. Should everybody who's on this call come and visit you in your office and visit Jack's on Disability Day on the Hill? Come see us. We'd love to have you to drop by and, and uh, for a visit. We uh, we love the disability uh, community. The, well, the disabled community are, are very important to us. Jeff Strand, you are just top notch. We always love when you stop by. And and uh, I'll tell the, the, the listeners on here, when Jeff Strand comes to our office, he has our full attention, and uh, we know what he's coming with is is legit and, and things that we need to be focused on because ultimately it's about making the lives of Tennesseans better. So, Jeff Strand, you are uh, probably my favorite of, of all of our folks we work with. You're, you're uh, right at the top, my friend. But but I invite the folks to stop by anytime, not just this uh, disability down the hill, but anytime, uh, and feel free to give us a call, reach out. If there's an issue, things that we can work with, help with, uh, that's what we're here for. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, the feeling is mutual. I will tell anybody and everybody who listens, best office in Cordell Hall. So thanks for joining us, and I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jax. Thanks, Harold. Thank you all so much. Y'all have a blessed day. And, and I'm not kidding. I'm not just sucking up to these guys. It, it, it is an office where you go in and you feel a lot better uh, when you come out than when you went in. So I encourage everybody to go give them a visit. Um, looks Thanks, like Jeff. It looks like we had a good question about yeah. that bill in the chat. Uh, Joy asked, was this for both Medicaid, TenCare, and Medicare? I'm Medicare and have waited 60 plus days before replacement tires. So I ordered them from Amazon. Um. So our intention is for it to be Medicare and Medicaid. We are directing 10 care to cover this as part of the benefits plan. Same with private payer insurance as well. Um, Medicare has some scary untested uh, rules around where a power wheelchair can go. So I, I'm jumping, uh, making a or, uh, jumping to a conclusion, making an assumption here. We're talking about a power wheelchair. Medicare says that you can't take your power wheelchair outside, which is silly. Uh, and so it is an open question whether or not we're going to be able to apply this to Medicare. It is our intention to apply it Medicare. And it is the way that we've written it is to apply to Medicare as well. Um, but that's a fantastic question because that is one of those odd, you know, untested gray areas uh, in these complex regulations. Uh, so thank you for asking that question. I'd be happy to follow up at all with that. Thumbs up. I really hope it's two thumbs up in that Medicare recognizes that we have the you know, authority to dictate this. All right, let me, I think we have, okay, I just wanna see, cover like two more things. I've got, I'm gonna do it really fast. So I'm gonna pick um, two of these. Um, the first is a very good one from, a, from our good friend again, uh, Senator Becky Massey, uh, it establishes, um, the existence even of an absentee ballot for someone who has a print disability. Uh, and it is directing the state to come up with that print disability absentee voting mechanism. Um, and it provides another option in a state where we are very strict about who can vote and how. 
Um, another option for folks with disabilities to be able to cast their vote at the ballot box come, well, not just November, but anytime. Uh, so a very good one. Uh, hoping to see that one pass. Haven't seen it move yet, uh, but we've got our fingers crossed on it. Uh, private school vouchers, we've touched on a little bit. Uh, we haven't seen it yet. We'll let you know when we do. Uh, and at the invocation of the disability community, I think that's when we move. But until then, I say we keep our ammo dry, powder dry. Yeah, that's how you say that one. Last one I want to talk on, involuntary commitment. Um, this is one is called Jillian's Law. It's a very uh, difficult subject. It's a sad story. Uh, it's a response to the Belmont shooting this fall. Um, and so what this one does is it lowers the threshold for involuntary commitment for people with intellectual disabilities. People with intellectual disabilities can already be involuntarily committed. This makes them have to, so how that would work is the prosecutor has to prove they're a threat to, the, to public safety in the, in the way that they're lowering it or proposing to lower it. Someone who is found incompetent to stand trial due to their intellectual disability must turn around and prove that they are affirmatively not a threat to public safety. And that is a really, really high threshold uh, and really dangerous slippery slope back towards institutionalization. Uh, not only is it back towards institutionalization, the state as it stands right now does not have the capacity to enforce this rule or enforce this law. Uh, and by passing this, we are subjecting ourselves potentially to a massive, massive civil rights lawsuit. So don't like this one. Okay, if you see anything else on here that you wanna talk about, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll put my email in the chat. Uh, it is also Jeff, J-E-F-F -F underscore S at tndisability.org. Please feel free to reach out. If you haven't signed up for my policy updates, you can do so on the website. So I think this is perhaps one of our last couple of slides since we are running low on time. Um, so after the webinar, ways to continue on to get involved with DDH, to enhance your DDH experience, you can go to tndisability.org to find materials that we discussed on this webinar, to access this record, recording and transcript of the webinar, and join in on our other Disability Day on the Hill plans. Make sure you RSVP. I hope to see everybody at Fat Bottom Brewery the night before to have a beer and talk over this stuff. And here's what we got going on. Upcoming virtual events, we've got Disability Advocacy Day, the whole state, literally everybody, lights up blue. Uh, so you can take a look at the Capitol and you can see that they've changed the colors on the rotunda to blue uh, over in Memphis. Uh, the big Bass Pro uh, pyramid turns blue. Uh, it's very cool. And so it's a celebration of all the work that disability advocates have done over the years. Uh, In-person events. These are the big ones. We've got the TDC Community Party. That's at Fat Bottom Brewing, uh, February 27th, 5 to 7 p.m. That's where I want to come and chat with you. It's a little bit more informal. Get to see, get to hear uh, what you're working on and get everybody amped up. It really is that community party, that community word uh, rings very true with that event. Uh, you feel very, you feel amongst your people and you feel very good about having the opportunity to, to chat, to have some heavy apps, to maybe have a beer if you're into that kind of thing uh, and, and really close, more closely knit our community. And then it's the big day, February 28th, Disability Day on the Hill. That'll be at the Cordell Hall Legislative Offices in Nashville, down by the bus station, right down the hill from the Capitol. Um, and it's fantastic. Last year was my first in-person Disability Day on the Hill. And as for as cool as the community party is, Disability Day on the Hill, when everybody is down there, uh, is so very cool. So I encourage you to RSVP at our website, work on setting up your legislative meetings, keep an eye out for what's coming up in the committees those days. Uh, and join us, join us, get your swag bag. And then to get very important things, often from me, sent directly to your phone. This is helpful, keeps you up to date. It makes it really easy for you. Text TEAMWORK, T-E-A-M-W-O-R-K, one word, to 72690. Then you can get disability policy updates and alert in Tennessee. You might get a message rate. We'll send one or four messages a week, especially during the session. We'll even send out my policy updates via there. And since it won't go any forward, I think that's it. So I will stop sharing. Nope, that's not how you do it. There we go. And I wanna thank everybody uh, for being on the call today. Look at that, we kept it right at two o'clock. I'm pretty proud of that, so I'll stop talking now. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me, Jeff, J-E-F-F, -F, 
underscore s at tndisability.org. I hope to see everybody at Disability Day on the Hill at the community party. And if you've got the opportunity to light up your own house blue on Disability Advocacy Day, I'd encourage you to do that. Otherwise, keep an eye on our socials at TN Disability, I think across the board, and we'll bring it to you. Again, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we look forward to spending the next month with you.